Well, good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Robert Underwood, and I'm going to be presenting what I believe is the third annual Limpresio tutorial. Um, I want to thank everyone for getting up. I know for those, especially in East Coast or West Coast time zones in the United States, this is a pretty early start, um, but I appreciate everybody being flexible. Um, if you haven't already, the QR code that's currently on the screen will allow you to access the tutorial materials that we will use for three hands-on exercises later this morning. Um, so I'd encourage you, if you haven't already done so, to um, scan this QR code and get set up with Docker. Um, so without further ado, where in high-performance computing do we use compressors? Um, we use them in applications, I.O. libraries, command line interfaces. We are interested in doing things like bounding user quality metrics, running distributed experiments, integrating with quality analysis tools, running testing, test coverage, and fuzzing to make sure that we don't have backwards breaking compatibility between versions of compressors, language bindings, and much, much more. And how do we currently use compressors? Well, before Libpressio, we would do so using the, mostly the C interfaces provided by each of these compressors. And as you observe, each of these different compressors have different um, configuration options, and they express how you do different things differently. So you may have to do error handling differently or pass dimensions in different orders. And that's only for three compressors. Um, as we get to more complicated situations and perhaps even the 30 so on compressors that Libpresio supports, um, having a consistent way to interface with those compressors becomes urgently important. So at this point, I wanna kind of go through some important logistics. Um, there will be a Q&A that's associated with this presentation. So as we're going through the slides, there will periodically be opportunities for you, the attendees, to um, provide feedback, uh, answer some questions, just to make sure that I'm explaining things well and that people are understanding um, the material as we're going through. So if you have not done so, you may want to, on your phone, um, scan the QR code um, to join the Q&A um, to provide you kind of an overview of our timeline for this morning. Um, we The tutorial is kind of broken up into three one-hour-ish chunks. Hour zero will be installation and basic usage. So we'll talk about SPAC. We'll talk about Libpresio concepts and basic usage. Um, in hour one, we'll talk about OPZ config and external metrics. And then if time allows, we'll talk about some of the new GPU compression features within Libpresio. And then finally, in hour two, we will begin talking about how to extend Libpresio yourself by writing your own compressor or meta compressor. Has everybody who wants to had a chance to scan the QR code? Okay. So we'll begin with our first um, audience Q&A question, which is, why are you here? What is the most urgent thing that you want to learn? We'll wait here for about a minute and allow some people to provide some answers. Anybody having difficulty with the Q&A? Feel free to unmute. Oop, there we go. Okay. Okay. So we have a lot of kind of good answers so far. Learn to use SPAC, okay. 
So I'm going to kind of continue ahead in the presentation. Um, suffice it to say, we will try and cover each of these major topics. Um, and as people, if you want to continue answering and you just haven't finished typing yet, I do have the answers for this on my slide on the left hand side of my screen. Um, so I will continue to see questions and kind of topics that people are interested in as we kind of roll through the presentation. So first, we're going to talk off with the talk about the basics of Lupresio, starting with installation and spec. Um, so for today, um, we're going to use a Docker container. Um, the Docker container will have basically all of the software that you'll need, um, allowing you to kind of get started with a bunch of dependencies pre-installed. Um, this is kind of the way that I'm recommended. This is the QR code that was on the first slide as we began. Um, but outside of the Docker container, if the Docker container doesn't work for you for whatever reason, the recommended way to install Lupresio is via SPAC. So I want to kind of get an idea of how many people have used SPAC um, and their level of experience with SPAC. So what I'm kind of seeing from this is that we have a, a few people who have um, used SPAC somewhat extensively, but the vast majority of people um, don't have very much experience using SPAC. So given that, I'll kind of try to go a little bit slowly through this section and make sure that everybody has a broad understanding of what it's doing and why. Um, so why do we care about SPAC in the context of Lupresio? Well, HPC software can be quite complex. Um, so here is just all of the dependencies that you would need to install if all that you want is to install Lupresio with just SZ and ZFP. Um, but if we add Lupresio opt into the mix, um, then our dependency graph grows to this. And if we want to install all of Libpresio, it grows to something that looks more like this. And just to kind of make matters worse, the dependency graph here has some kind of deceptive pieces of it. Specifically, um, you could have potentially different versions of MPI, which in turn have different dependencies, potentially depending on what site you're at and what hardware you need to support. Um, you may have a different linear algebra library. You may have a different GPU package environment. All of these things grow the complexity of the software that you need to install in order to use Libpresio. So providing a consistent way to manage this was urgently important um, when starting to develop Libpresio. Um, you may ask, what about my favorite alternative, um, like a system package manager, um, Brew if you're on a Mac, DNF if you're on Fedora, Apt if you're on Ubuntu. Um, generally speaking, these don't model HPC dependencies very well, specifically things like MPI. Um, and they tend to deliver unoptimized binaries, which are not ideal for making sure that things run on whatever platform that you may have available to you at the highest performance possible. Um, language specific tools like PIP, Conda, Cargo, if you're familiar with Rust, or um, pkg.jl, if you're using Julia, um, also don't model HPC dependencies rather well. Um, dealing with MPI and Anaconda, for example, is an entire mess. Um, and they tend to have poor tooling for the language that they weren't designed for. Um, so Python's support for C, at least in my opinion, is somewhat poor um, within their package ecosystem, although perhaps getting slightly better. They also are going to deliver you unoptimized binaries. Um, containers, things like Docker, Podman, Singularity, um, someone still fundamentally has to build the container. Um, and if you're on different machines, like for example, one of the problems we ran into at the SC tutorial is if you're on a different hardware platform, like for example, an M1 ARM-based Mac, you're going to need a different Docker container than people running an x86 container. Or if you're on PowerPC, you're still going to need a different thing. So ultimately, somebody still has to build the container. 
Um, so how do you actually go about installing software using SPAC? Um, so SPAC provides an expressive domain specific language to customize packets installation. Um, so for example, if you wanted to install the MPI leaks package, you can say, just say SPAC install MPI leaks and SPAC will do its best to give you a reasonable version of MPI leaks. Um, but you can be much, much more specific than that. You can specify a specific version or that you want to use a specific compiler. Um, there's also the notion of build variants. Um, the most common place where you will see this is to support particular GPU architectures. Um, for example, you want to say that I want CUDA support for my library would be plus CUDA. And maybe you want to compile for CUDA architecture 86, which corresponds to um, variants of the Ampere um, execution platform. SPAC generally does a good job of providing a reasonable set of compiler flags for packages, um, but it's also possible in SPAC to specify specific compiler flags that get associated with a particular package or all of the packages in your um, tree. The way that I use this most often is when I want to do profiling on a package. So I want to build with optimizations, um, but I also want to set the dash F no omit frame pointer um, compiler flag, which ensures that um, I can get more meaningful debugging information out of the binaries that I've developed. Um, something that's relevant for the folks who are joining from Clemson, um, where you have a supercomputing system that has multiple different generations of CPU architecture in a single HPC cluster, um, you can set a specific hardware architecture target for your binaries that are being built. So you can set for a lowest common denominator by saying like something like target equals x86, um, but you can also say something really advanced like Cascade Lake. Um, you can also set uh, constraints on your dependencies. In this case, they're saying build MPI leaks 3.3 using MPITCH 3.2, which MPITCH has to be built by GCC 493. Um, so this syntax is recursive, and you can have multiple dependency clauses to specify the specific set of packages that you need um, for your software. In recent versions of SPAC um, released as of this November, um, a bunch of quality life improvements have been introduced. Um, so for example, you now have the ability to kind of repeat the sigil plus in order to have a dependency propagate down to all of its dependencies. So for example, plus plus CUDA not only enables the CUDA dependency on Lumpresio, but also enables it on, in this case, QSZ. Um, if we had ZFP here, it would also enable it on um, ZFP as well. And we're going to specify for all of the packages in the tree, we're going to use that CUDA arch equals 86. Um, additionally, um, C flags no longer propagate to everything in the tree by default. If you want the C flags to propagate to everything, you replace this single equal sign with a double equal sign like we used here for CUDA arch. Another really cool new feature in SPAC is the ability to specify a Git branch um, or a Git repo um, using syntax that looks like this. So if you want to pull the latest develop branch, even if it isn't specified in the package.py file, which defines the SPAC package, you can now install a specific version and you can even tell um, SPAC to treat it as if it's a particular named version within the package history. Um, this gives you a lot of flexibility in being able to install um, development versions of packages very, very easily. Um, SPAC also has the ability to handle ABI incompatible in interfaces like MPI. Um, so MPI is in dependency management jargon, what's called a virtual dependency. There are multiple things that implement MPI. And if you know anything about MPI, there can be differences between things. For example, if you're using an MPITCH family of MPI, um, implementation of MPI, you'll see things like MPI com are specified as an int. Whereas if you use open MPI, it's actually a void star pointer 
um, pointing to either some statically allocated information or some dynamically allocated information generated by the open API runtime. Um, in either case, um, you can specify a concrete implementation. Um, here we're saying any open MPI that is at least version 1.4, um, but you can also use the virtual dependency to represent particular versions of the standard um, question. Okay, I will keep going. Um, and this is true of many things. Um, they're actually planning to make um, virtual dependencies for each of the languages. So for example, in the near future, it's expected that you'll be able to say depend on C plus CXX at 17 to say depend on a compiler that uses C++ 17 or greater, for example. Um, another feature that I think is really important for making effective use of SPAC is what's called a SPAC environment. So a SPAC environment is a YAML file um, that specifies a particular set of packages that you want installed to a particular subdirectory. Um, this makes it much easier to use, and you can even do things like special, specialize it per site. Um, so for example, if you're at Argon and you're using the new, um, if you're using the Bebop machine, you'll say maybe want to use MKL as your BLAST implementation, um, and, and you wouldn't use Cray and Pitch for that system, but you would use um, Intel MPI. Um, but if you're on, say, um, Polaris, I believe Polaris uses a Intel CPU as well, so it would still be MKL, but it would use Cray and Pitch instead. Um, you may also want to use a specific compiler, um, depending on your system, or to account for specific hardware. Um, these things are encoded in the list of specs that you have, as well as the target that you're specifying that you want to use. Okay. Um, and you can kind of create these yourself, um, or you can use one from an existing package. Um, so I think it's worth talking a little bit about how SPAC determines what specific things to install. Um, so if you are a user, you can provide um, things to install on the command line. So here we're installing HDF5 version 1.12.0 using the debug variant. Now, you can additionally further constrain this using local environment configuration. That's what we just talked about on the previous slide, as well as site-specific configuration in packages.yaml. So this allows you to do configuration that's specific to a machine, for example. You can also have things in the package.py file, um, as well as the SPAC default um, set of variants. All of these things are passed to a um, solver program called the concretizer. And what the concretizer does is it solves a SAT problem, a Boolean satisfiability problem, um, in order to determine what exact set of packages are ultimately going to get used. So now I want to talk a little bit about SPAC and Lipresio, and specifically what I consider to be the happy path. Um, this would be what I would strongly encourage you to use if at all possible. Um, so you can use the Docker container that we provide for this tutorial. Um, it has all of the software that you may need. Um, you also can get binary packages translation. You don't have to build them yourself. If your system uses Ubuntu 20.04 um, with the GCC 11.1 compiler. Um, very soon, uh, if you're using the latest development version of SPAC, um, any development version or any RHEL 8 compatible distribution will also have binary packages available. Um, it's also possible if you're using a system with the absolute latest system stack of Cray software. Um, as far as I know, this is only a handful of machines. I think Summit has some of this set up. And I believe that um, one of the machines at LANL has this set up. Sadly, none of these machines are the machines at Argon. Um, if you're using one of the machines at Argon, um, 
I have some additional suggestions on the next page um, that will help you get started there. Um, you are also on the happy path if you're using the latest version of SPAC, specifically any version after November 25th of 2022. If you're using this version, most of the Libpressio packages that you'll want to use are available in the mainline SPAC tree, um, which means that you don't need to set up any additional things. Lastly, you are on the happy path if you use SPAC's environment feature. Um, being on and using SPAC's environment feature automatically sets a bunch of um, environment variables such as CMake prefix path, um, the HDF5 plugin path that you no longer have to set yourself if you use the environment feature. And it gives you one directory that you can specify for your LD library path um, to ensure that your software comes from the um, correct version. Um, lastly, you get the set of improvements to how you can specify um, variants that need to be set on dependencies as well by using this syntax. Um, getting, what happens if you go off the happy path? Um, if you are off the happy path, it generally just means instead of being able to use binary software, um, you have to have SPAC compile it for you. Um, if you're on Mac OS or Windows, um, things are generally somewhat buggy. Um, my recommendation here is that you rely on either Docker or WSL if you're developing um, locally on your laptop. Um, particular compressors may not be able to be compiled natively for Mac OS or for Windows. Um, generally speaking, Mac OS is generally usable, but much harder to configure. There's a bunch of documentation on the SPAC documentation page for how to get that set up correctly. Um, and most compressors are implemented using POSIX APIs, which may or may not be implemented in Windows. Um, so getting it to build outside of WSL can be quite challenging. Um, at Argon and Oak Ridge machines, I've developed a set of guide um, kind of run books that tell you what the appropriate set of packages that you should um, install your SPAC to use um, that you can find here. Um, so while we don't have binary packages, uh, we do have known working configurations for a bunch of the DOE machines. Um, lastly, using the Bebop machine at Argon, we have a shared installation of Libpressio that I update about once about twice a year or so um, with the latest version of software. Um, at this point, I want to kind of talk about kind of the top 10 SPAC commands that I think are worth knowing. Um, SPAC install allows you to install packages or environments, relatively intuitive. Uninstall, of course, does the opposite. Um, when you're using an environment and you're using a recent version of SPAC, um, install and uninstall don't necessarily actually um, just install things. And the reason for this is that there's a concretization step that needs to happen. So in the latest versions of SPAC, if you want to install something, you would say SPAC add name of package, SPAC add name of package, and then SPAC install does this solve step and then installs all of the various packages that you need. Another thing that would be useful for many of you is the ability to use SPAC develop. So if you're in a, um, if you want to edit Libpressio to provide um, new functionality or features, you can say SPAC develop name of the spec at git.master, and it will clone the package into a subdirectory where you can edit it, make changes, add new features, um, so on and so forth. And whenever you run SPAC install, it will rebuild using the specific version that got checked out. Um, so this is a very, very powerful feature that I think really improves the developer experience for um, users wanting to adopt SPAC. Um, SPAC spec asks SPAC how it will 
build a particular package. This is really, really useful. Um, and this is how I got the graphs that I presented earlier um, using Limpressio. If you want to know what the variants and options and versions available for a particular package, you can use SPAC info. Um, I think I will kind of bring this over here and show you what some of those things look like now. So if we say spec, spec, Limpressio, it'll take a little second. Normally doesn't take quite this long. I think it's because I'm screen recording. Okay, so here we said if we don't provide any additional options, we see that we're going to get Libpressio using the develop branch, using GCC 12. Most of the variants are turned off. We're using the CMake build option release with debug info, and we're building for Fedora 36 using an Ice Lake Intel processor. Um, we can then change this to say, depend on Libpressio with a Z. And what we will see is that it will um, add a Z2 and a series of its dependencies to the build graph. Um, SPAC info gives you information on the version history. SPAC list gives you a list of available packages to install. Um, SPAC find, specifically when you use the dash L and the dash V flags, gives you a list of installed packages. So what we see here um, is that we now have a build that includes az 2 And by default, SPAC will try to aggressively reuse existing builds of your software. So in this case, my guess is that I already had several of these packages installed. Um, so it says, this is the specific version that I'm going to give you when you ask for that. Um, lastly, when you're using SPAC environments, if you say SPAC env activate and give it a directory that activates the environment, SPAC env create dash D allows you to create a new environment. Apparently, I do not have things cloned and set up, so I will do that later. Kind of continuing on. Um, how to get to know some of the key Limpressio packages. Um, there's kind of two major packages that you need to know. Every other package exists as a variant on one of these two packages. Um, so Libpressio is the main SPAC package. It has the vast majority of compressors that you may wish to use, um, most of which are turned off by default. And the reason for this is to shorten build times. Um, and then just to kind of illustrate that, if you're using ImageMagick or perhaps the MGuard version 1.3, um, these packages take very long amounts of times to compile. So MGAR, the new version, takes at least half an hour on my machine. Um, Image Magic, if you're compiling it with all of its dependencies, which includes LLVM, um, can take three to four hours to install everything. Um, so just be aware that some of the dependencies can add a substantial amount of time to your build. Um, 
And then there's also a package, the Presio Tools, which provides a set of extensions as well as the compressors that are licensed under GPL-like licenses. Um, so this includes Spur, Tthresh, NVComp, um, and for historical reasons, OpsyConfig. OpsyConfig is not GPL licensed. It was just an extension, so it was not included in the main um, SPAC repository. So now we're going to kind of test people's knowledge. Um, what specs would ensure that you've installed the Libpresio command line tools um, using EZ2 using stats support? Any other guesses? So the correct answers here are actually these bottom two. Um, so the reason for this is Libpresio tools um, can either have EZ with stats included, uh, which may get set in your package.py file, or this option right here um, kind of implicitly sets the plus as the flag on the Libpresio because we've asked for Libpresio to depend on the Libpresio tools, and the only way that it can do that is using um, the plus as the option on Libpresio. And this one won't work um, because there is no EZ variant on the Libpresio tools package. Okay. Another question, what spec installs Libpresio's Python API with Tthresh support? I'm gonna guess the third one. Um, so actually, it is the fourth one. <laughs> so close. Yeah. And, and the reason for this is that, remember, Tthresh is GPL-based, and Python is not. So if it's a GPL-based compressor, um, it's going to be in the Libpresio tools package. Otherwise, it's going to be in Libpresio plus Python. So we're running a little bit behind where I'd like to be for the morning, but we'll go ahead and jump into some basics of Libpresio and some concepts. Um, so Libpresio provides a common abstraction for a set of features that you may be interested in, loading compressors, configuring them, compressing and decompressing, representing data, error reporting, and configuring metrics. So the code that appears on the right-hand side of the screen is using Libpresio's C API, and what we're going to do here is if we just change this one line in blue, we can change from using EZ to ZFP or MGARD with a single um, line change. Um, it's also possible to load your configuration from a JSON file, though I'm not sure if I have that in the slides for today. Um, Libpresio has kind of six major concepts to be aware of. There's the Presio struct, which is responsible for creating most of the other ones. Um, Presio data, which represents the actual data that you're willing to use. Presio options, which represents configuration for a bunch of these things. And then we have metrics, compressors, and IO. Compressors are what you would expect. Metrics allow you to measure operations that are performed on Presio compressors. So this allows you to compute things like SSIM or PSNR or Pearson's coefficients or timings or compression ratios. All of these things can be done with Libpresio metrics. Um, and then IO just provides a set of routines to read and write Presio data objects from a variety of file formats. So regardless of what file format you're coming from, there's an easy way to import data that's been into a format that Libpresio understands. Um, 
at this point, I want to ask what programming language people use, plan to use most with Libpressio. C++. Okay. So we got a lot of Python, a lot of C, a handful of C++. Um, for those who said other, um, I'm curious what the answer is. If you just unmute yourself and answer real quick. It might just be that uh, we have to select an order uh, of the oh, languages, okay. so maybe it just okay. I these are the defaults. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No matter what, other will be selected to some degree. Okay, that's good to know. Thanks, Max. Okay, so mostly C, some Python, and some C plus um, plus. Looks like the other options are substantially less popular. Uh, so let's kind of keep going with that in mind. Um, so the Presio um, thing I mentioned earlier, it really exists for kind of three purposes. One, it gives you the ability to query the list of supported compressors for your particular installation of Libpressio and get version information on the Libpressio library itself. Um, this is useful so you can code around differences as version numbers change. Um, and which compressors are particularly um, built for your particular usage of Libpressio. So here um, we are asking for the EZI2 library. Um, now, what happens if we use a version, if we use a version of Libpressio that was not compiled with EZI2 support? What do you think is going to get returned by line two of this code? Thomas guessed a no-op compressor. That's probably a better default than I currently have it set to, um, but that's actually not the correct answer. So what's going to get returned here is a null pointer. Um, and why it returns a null pointer is it allows you to detect that it's you've asked for something that's not supported. And then you can use routines like um, Presio get error message, um, which allows you to detect that this is indeed why this particular compressor was not supported. Um, so one of the most common things that I see um, students run into is they just say SPAC installed in Presio, and they don't build any of the um, compressor plugins. And because they didn't build any of the compressor plugins, this function returns null. And because that returns null, they get a seg fault as soon as they go to call any of the functions that use this um, Presio compressor object. So this is kind of a key thing to be aware of. Um, Presio options is kind of a key value store. You can think of it kind of like a Python dictionary mapping from string to some set of options. Um, it has multiple uses within the Libpressio um, ecosystem. It's used for options, which are kind of runtime settings, things like the EZ airbound mode or the EZ relative airbound. Um, but it also can be used for other things. It can be used for configuration. Um, so if something is exposed um, using a um, pound defined somewhere in the library, it's likely also exposed as a Libpressio configuration. Um, these are compile time settings that you can't generally change. Uh, metrics for results. These allow you to observe runtime properties of the compressor. So for example, EZ2 uses this um, to return a bunch of internal statistics that tell you what exactly um, what exactly is happening in terms of what pieces of information are used for different aspects. Um, you can introspect um, Presio options structures to ask them what types are in them. 
you can get values out of them, you can set values inside of them, you can view casts. So if you provide a string, it can convert it to an integer or um, things of this nature, allowing you to very easily um, write generic code um, like this. Um, you can also validate that all of the options that you've set are options that actually exist on a compressor. Um, Presio IO allows you to very easily um, read and write data. Um, so here, um, we are reading a binary data file um, with 500 by 500 by 100 um, float 32 values um, from a particular path. There are other facilities as well. Um, so for example, this code here um, shows a, a relatively recent ext addition to Libpressio, which is this um, by extension metadata object. Um, so the by extension metadata object knows that since this is a .csv file, um, that it should read it using a CSV file reader. So it will take this and it will produce the dense array that you're expecting um, by looking at this extension and saying, oh, this is CSV, I know how to read this. Um, this also works for HDF5. So you can say by extension, give it an HDF5 file. Um, but in the case of HDF5, if the field you're reading is not called data set, um, you additionally need to provide this HDF5 data set property, um, and it can read an HDF5 buffer for you as well. Um, there are many different HDF or many different Presio IO formats. Um, we have ones for Python, binary files, um, you name it, we probably have some way to read it for you. Um, and it's pretty easy to add your own of these as well, um, but we won't talk about that till hour two. Um, Presio data is a generic reference to data. If you're familiar with C++, it's roughly equivalent to a C++23 std in the span of T, um, with where T is a runtime determinable parameter. Um, so here um, you can represent a empty data object of type byte with zero values, or you can say a um, array of type float32 with a particular set of dimensions. You can query the type of the data, the size of it. You can get pointers to the values. Um, there are so-called owning versus non-owning versions of these, um, which allow you to kind of handle some of the memory allocation aspects of this. Um, and it's relatively extensible, um, so you can very easily um, provide a pointer that's been allocated by, say, CUDA um, memalloc instead, so you can have GPU allocated memory instead of host allocated memory. Um, Presio Compressor does the thing that you would expect. Um, so you can call Presio Compressor Compress, pass it a particular compressor object, and then input in the compressed data. Um, you can also ask it for its versions. You can configure them. Um, you can pass multiple buffers at a time with APIs like Compress Mini and Decompress Mini. Um, these routines return error messages by an error code. So press your compressor compress. If it returns zero, it's successful. If it returns greater than zero, then it is an error. If it returns less than zero, it's a warning. Um, warnings are used to indicate things like you may not be getting the optimal performance um, based off what you've requested the compressor to do. Presio metrics. Again, we'll talk more about these as we're kind of going through the morning, um, but Presio metrics allow you to kind of have before and after calls that get called before any particular compressor function. Um, this allows you to do all sorts of things like computing actual quality metrics, um, but also much more clever things like um, computing timings or compression ratios or just saving files to disk. That way you can go back and analyze them later. Um, I will kind of round out um, this hour of talks um, with a desperate plea for you to please check the error codes. Um, nearly every API in Libpressio has a means to return an error code or an exception. And the error message means should be intelligible and tell you what you probably did wrong if you actually look at it. Um, the most common cases I see students run into is you asked for a compressor that Libpressio support wasn't compiled for. 
or are you asked to read a file that doesn't exist or is of the wrong size? That said, um, let's now move on to our first hands-on activity. Um, at this point, I will stop the recording um, and give everybody a chance to work on the activity. If you run into any difficulties, um, feel free to unmute yourself and ask any questions. So Lupresio has a number of advanced capabilities. These can include things like external metrics to get metrics from a user's application, um, OpZ config, which allows you to automatically tune for user metrics, GPU support, um, automatic parallel compression with MPI or OpenMP, um, custom pipelines, for example, Ribbon SE3. You can use it with HDFI filters. There's automated regression testing, configuration file support, provenance, IO support, advanced diagnostics, and much, much more. Um, because of that, we're only really going to be able to cover three of these today. Um, so I'm focusing on the three that your advisors have said is likely the most important, external metrics, OPC config, and GPU support. So let's begin with talking about external metrics, what they are and what they provide. Um, so users care about specific scientific um, quantities of interest when they're considering their experiments. They care about things like the L infinity norm or the change in the weighted mean or the Pearson's coefficient or the p-value for the KS test or the spatial relative error. Um, these are metrics that users care about but aren't always implemented in whatever um, library that you may want. So you may have to pull in some external code in order to provide these metrics for your application. Um, Lupresio provides a set of different ways for doing this. Um, there are ones that are provided within memory, such as the R interpreter or C++ modules. Um, but there also are a set of external metrics that are available um, that can either use MPI, um, POSIX fork exec, or a remote HTTP endpoint um, to provide particular metrics that you're interested in. And we're going to focus on this one because it's kind of the easiest to use, um, although it comes at the cost of a modest amount of performance. So external metrics allow you to enable code reuse. Um, applications likely already have implementations of metrics that they care about. So if you're wanting to access these, um, you likely want to be able to import them from some external system. Um, external metrics provide ways to import these kinds of things into Libpressio. So if you kind of think that think of this as a decision tree, if your metric is implemented in C or C++ and it's easy to access in a library, or you have something that's absolutely performance critical, use the C++ API and implement a new Pressio metric. Um, if you have a something with a long startup time but is not implemented in C or C++, my recommendation is to use the metrics RPC server. We'll talk more about that. Um, if your program is an MPI program, um, then we rec I recommend using the external metric with the MPI com spawn API, <laughs> R, use the R metric. And if you just have an arbitrary Python or some other language program, you can just use external metrics directly. We're going to focus on these two because I think that they cover most of the common cases. So writing an external metric using a script. Um, the API that was designed for this was intended to be implementable in just about any language that exists. Um, basically, you're going to print out a short header that says external colon API equals version number, followed by one line saying the name of the metric that you care about, which needs to be an ASCII character between um, is a to Z, capital or lowercase, followed by an equal sign, followed by a um, double precision floating point value specified as a string. So pre, post. Additionally, you need to provide a set of defaults. So basically, if you call the script without any arguments, it needs to print out the list of metrics that it supports. And if you want to pass it to buffers, here is the set of command line flags that your program needs to interpret in order to 
um, pass it. So in this case, we're saying external metric five, pre-value and post-value. Um, if you need to be able to debug this, anything that's printed to standard error is automatically captured, uh, making it easy to kind of pull these things in from other sources. Um, it's also possible to print no things and just use this for its side effects. So the example that's included with exercise three or four, I can't remember which one, um, does this with a matplotlib plotting script um, so that you can kind of plot a series of features about the differences between the uncompressed and the compressed data. Um, so this kind of gives you an extensible way to kind of bring in metrics that are just an arbitrary bash or Python script that you may have. Um, it's also possible to do this for metrics that require multiple buffers. Um, this just requires a little bit of configuration in the external metrics API in order to pull these kinds of things in. Um, so here is the Python script that implements the metric that I was referring to earlier. Um, basically, you're going to print out something to declare the version. I generally do this as the absolute first line of whatever script that I'm writing. And the reason why I do it this way is it ensures that nothing is printed on standard out before um, the version header. Um, otherwise, you'll run into problems where um, it's not able to interpret what your program is doing. Um, then we have kind of a, the biggest chunk of these lines of code, which rep represents um, command line parsing stuff. So if you're familiar with Python, this is pretty standard arg parse um, stuff here. Um, here, we're computing the mean, excluding all values that are zero. So we just have a little bit of code that reads in the file, interprets the shape. And then we compute the mean as described. And then we have printing, showing the metric. Otherwise, not. Okay. Any questions on what I'm doing with this script? Hearing none. Um, it's also possible to do this with a metric that's based on an HTTP API. Um, this is useful for languages or libraries that have long startup time. So a good example of this would be Julia. And the, the format of the JSON messages that you'll send in the request um, should look really familiar. They're, they're basically the same arguments that would get passed to the command line interface in the previous um, script example. So these are the same arguments that we would have passed to the script, just as an array called args that get passed. And then in return, um, the server, the metric server should respond with a JSON object with three keys, standard out, standard error, and return code, which correspond to the same things that you would have had if you were using the script. Again, the idea here is the format is really straightforward and familiar and implementable in just about any programming language that exists. Um, so here is an example of doing this for two climate metrics using Julia. So we have a set of imports for um, Julia. We have some kind of boilerplate web servery kinds of things. Um, then on lines 18 through um, say 43, we have a bunch of command line parsing stuff. And then we compute the DSSIM and the two sample chaos test, um, kind of pulling in metrics from libraries that are implemented in Julia and in Python respectively. Uh, so again, you can implement these kinds of external metrics very, very quickly, allowing you to very rapidly um, consider a bunch of options. So at this point, um, you have a performance critical metric with a large initialization time. What metrics APIs could be appropriate for this circumstance? 
So we have several different kind of responses here. Um, some people have said the external metrics RPC API. Some people have said the external metrics script API. Um, when you have a, a large startup time, I would say that generally speaking, the external metrics script API is less appropriate. Um, and the reason for this is that it's going to execute the script every single time, which means that you're going to incur your startup costs every single time when you use the script API. If you use the RPC API or the Lepresio C++ metrics API, um, you are able to do that startup cost once using a singleton and then kind of hold on to a reference to that and use it appropriately. So I would say either of the first two answers here are appropriate ways to use um, a metric with a large startup time. So now that we have the ability to pull in an arbitrary metric from some user's application, the next question we probably have is how do we perform some tuning of a compressor in order to satisfy um, it? And for that, we're going to use opzconfig. So first I wanna start off with asking the question, why is configuration search like this really hard? Um, and specifically, why can't we just use binary search? Well, the short answer for binary search is that it doesn't work consistently. So the figure on the right shows the relationship between um, I believe it's the value range relative air bound and the compression ratio for some data set using SD2. And as you can see, the line that represents this curve is very noisy. There's a lot of non monotonicity. Um, it may even be non convex, um, which means that doing optimization on this is going to be very difficult. Um, so by using more advanced search techniques, we can kind of still be able to achieve reasonable search, but we're not going to get stuck in regions of the search that look like this little porcupine right here. Um, other questions people may ask is why not use analytic-based approaches or specialized compressors? And in short, they're expensive to develop. So if you have a limited amount of time, you may be able to trade a certain amount of computational time for a certain amount of developer time, overall improving your productivity. Um, so here is kind of highlighting a bunch of the metrics that we talked about earlier when we were talking about external metrics and saying, well, what, what metrics are supported by which um, techniques? And we see opz config, which I'm what I'm presenting on today, um, covers a, a very wide array of metrics that you potentially are, that you potentially care about. So how is opz config implemented? Opsi config attempts to formulate the compressor configuration problem as an optimization problem, defining a set of non-fixed compressor settings over a set of feasible compressor settings for which we will maximize some quality metric with respect to the data for a particular field and time step and compared to the decompressed data for a particular field and time step, possibly with some fixed parameters for the metric. Um, what about constraints on the objective? Um, so suppose you have a set of quality metrics that you care about. So maybe this is compression ratio. Maybe this is um, the data SSIM. And you want to achieve the maximum compression ratio um, subject to a certain DSSIM requirement. So you can instead define your overall quality objective function as this piecewise quantity, which basically says we're going to maximize the Q0 in this case, the compression ratio, subject that all quality metrics are greater than or less than our particular threshold for quality and return negative infinity otherwise. Um, what I've kind of found since we published this work is it's actually slightly better to define it this way. Um, so this provides an improved penalty term, which specifies Q of I as a metric in a, in a mathematical sense. So basically it's greater than zero at all values and zero means perfect. Um, in this case, by defining it as the maximum distance you are away from an appropriate quality measure, you, you can much more rapidly um, 
get the optimizer to find a reasonable section because you're actually providing information about when it's far away versus when it's actually close to a valid configuration. Um, so how do you handle multiple objectives like this in Libpresio? Um, so to do this, you need to compile Libpresio with plus Lua and use the composite colon script option um, in order to handle multiple quality constrained objectives. So here is an example of a Lua script from a um, example that I provided earlier. Um, so basically if the compression, you get the compression ratio, you get the DSSIM, you're going to require a DSSIM of at least 0.999. So if that's true, we use the compression ratio. Otherwise we use how far away we were from the metric bound. And then we return the name of the metric that we want to use, in this case, objective, with the actual value. Any questions on what this Lua code is doing? So kind of looking, stepping back and kind of looking at the bigger picture and how this all fits together. Um, OpZ config exists as a meta compressor. So it's it implements the same interface as a Limpresio compressor. Um, but it does so in a way that allows you to um, automatically tune the compressors. So OpZ config will take care of running the compressors and it does so using the Limpresio compressor interface. So whether you have SZ, ZFP, MGuard, et cetera. Um, all of these compressors are kind of handled through one consistent interface. Uh, you can then search um, using a search technique like FRAS or binary search or FMFS or others. It's very easy to add your own search um, plugin, though we won't be talking about that specifically today. Um, and it's easy to incorporate metrics both from the internal set of metrics, but also from specific applications. Uh, a really important concept to understand when using OpZ config is that ultimately to use OpZ config, you're going to need a notion of what's called a module tree. Um, so now that we've introduced the concept of a meta compressor, um, you can imagine that a meta compressor is going to delegate to some set of modules in order to do its work. Um, so in this case, the op module has four slots. It has a slot for a search metric, a slot for a search method, a slot for a compressor, and a slot for a compressor metric. Um, and then in the case of using Z3, Z3 has only one slot. It has a slot for an air stat or a compressor metric. In this case, we're going to use air statistics. Um, but this isn't the only way that you could formulate this tree. Um, this is actually the tree that we used um, in the OpZ config paper. So we're going to try a guess first. If the guess is not successful, we're going to distribute over a grid using MPI. And then we're in each grid cell, we're going to use FRAS um, to do our search within each grid cell. Um, and as you can see, we have metrics for each of the compressor modules that we're using. We're introducing the Presio compressor module um, in order to abstract across some of the differences in air bounds that are provided. So in the case of SC3, it doesn't really do much, but if we're using ZFP, ZFP doesn't provide a value, rel value range relative air bound mode. So instead, using the Presio module here means that we get a consistent way to configure the air bound for this guy. Uh, any questions on what I mean here by a module tree and why it might be important? Okay. So hearing no questions, what might this look like in some code? So on the right, I have some code that uses the Presio's Python interface. And I kind of show where each of these meta compressor things are getting configured. So we're going to say we're going to use the compressor ID opt, because opt is what we want to be as the root of our tree. Um, and then under the early configuration, we're going to basically set up our tree. So we're going to say opt compressor is ZFP, opt search is going to be FRAS, and the metric that we're going to use is going to be time. Now, since we're not using the naming option, which I'll talk about later, this 
Presio metric because we're using the generic Presio name instead of something like ZFB or SZ, this is going to automatically delegate down to all of the compressors in the tree. So it's going to get set not only for opt, but it's also going to get set for ZFP. And then you may be asking, well, Robert, you didn't set the slot for the search metric. Well, the search metric defaults to the progress printer, um, which is probably what you want anyway. And then all of these kind of remaining options here in the compressor config box are configuration parameters. Um, so here are kind of the, the key configuration parameters that you will almost always use. You will almost always use opt compressor, opt search, um, which I've kind of described earlier, opt compressor and opt search basically set up the module tree as we described earlier. Opt inputs is a list of strings that correspond to the settings that we're going to modify um, on every invocation of our, our tuning process. Opt output is the metric that we're doing as our objective. If you provide multiple entries in the opt output array, um, these options will be printed, they'll be able to be stored, um, they will be computed, but we're only going to use the first entry of this array to guide the search in most cases. Then we have a set of three options that define the search domain. So for each of the opt inputs, there is a lower bound and upper bound and a is integral option. Lower bound and upper bound should be relatively straightforward. Um, but opt is integral says whether or not this item is a floating point value or it's an integer value. Um, so this is just a hint to the solver um, that gives it a lot of information about how it should be searching over that value. Um, there's also opt max iterations. This is how many iterations we want to use our, for our search. I believe it defaults to 50, um, which is a reasonable default in many cases. And then lastly, we have the objective mode name. Um, this allows us to say whether we're minimizing, maximizing, or trying to find a target value. Okay. Any questions on these terms and kind of how they fit together? Okay. Um, so what about execution parameters, um, things that aren't just time? Many of the concepts that we've talked about so far in terms of tuning for quality also just translate because uh, essentially compressors are just data flow. Um, the most important things I will say here is when you're tuning execution metrics such as compression time, your results may be non-deterministic. Um, so for that reason, you may want to use a meta compressor that runs the compression task um, some multiple of times so that you can take an average over the running time. Um, and by taking an average, you kind of smooth out some of the differences resulting from non-determinism. Um, additionally, you wanna keep in mind that performance evaluation potentially can be costly and you can have a fair bit of contention as resource sharing becomes more, more important. So you're not going to want, for example, um, utilize multiple threads in the search process if you're going to be doing um, tuning for timings um, because you don't want interference from multiple search tasks that are happening at the same time. Okay. So one of the more frequent questions I have is um, how to set lower bound, upper bound, and is integral. Um, so here I'm providing um, kind of a question. So we're tuning to opt inputs, Presio abs, which is the absolute air bound, and QOZ stride, which is kind of the minimum block size that we're going to use for the compression. So I want people to kind of take a reasonable guess as to what a reasonable configuration for these parameters might be. 
Would anyone like to unmute and take a guess? Well, let's kind of go through these step by step. So we have, okay, we have some guesses for D. Okay. So let's start with kind of identifying what's the differences between these. Um, so apparently there is a typo because um, these are supposed to be different. So A and B are exactly the same because of a typo. Um, the, the first entry says we're going to use a lower bound of 1e e minus 15. Um, so why might we not want to use 0 here? So many of the air bounded lossy compressors that currently exist, um, if you pass them an absolute air bound of zero, um, they may not have implemented that special case correctly. Um, so because they may not have implemented that special case correctly, um, the compressor can potentially crash um, if it guesses zero. Um, so for that reason, I would recommend against using these options unless the particular compressor that you're tuning also defines Presio colon lossless. So if it defines Presio colon lossless, um, then you're guaranteed to also support an entry of zero as the absolute air bound. Um, so for that reason, we can kind of eliminate these three options. Um, these two are both correct because they are the same. Um, so I believe what the difference supposed to be was here was um, stride needs to be an integer, but if you imagine a stride of zero probably doesn't make any sense. That was supposed to be what option A was. Um, and that's kind of what's going on there. Um, some kind of general suggestions for using opsy config. Um, first, a couple of debugging su suggestions. Um, you should generally start out when you're doing your tuning process by using ZFP as the compressor that you want to test with. Um, and the reason why I make this suggestion is that ZFP is by far the most stable of the compressor implementations. It's far less likely than any of the others um, to crash on a bizarre input um, or a bizarre set of configurations. Um, it does a much better job of making sure that you get consistent answers regardless of what settings you use. Um, so generally try debugging with ZFP first before considering other compressors. Um, again, you can pass any Presio metrics um, option to a Lupresio compressor. Um, I'm going to point out these two here, write debug inputs and print options. Um, these will both allow you to introspect what um, data gets passed to a compressor. This can make it much easier to debug um, what options are getting passed or what input is being passed that without, without having you to necessarily modify your code all over the place to print out these kind of intermediate outputs that you may be interested in. Um, avoid metrics overheads where possible. So this is things like, for example, if you have a large startup cost, make sure that you're using either the remote metrics API or the C++ um, Presio metrics API directly. Um, Prefer allocating threads where more knowledge can be used. Um, so you can potentially allocate parallel resources either to FRAS or to the distributed grid. Um, I would generally recommend allocating more threads to FRAS. Um, and the reason for this is that FRAS shares knowledge amongst its threads, whereas dist grid does not. Um, and that generally will lead you to a faster solution. Um, my last piece of advice is instead of having opt directly talk to a compressor, consider using opt to talk to one of these three meta compressors. So you can use the Presio meta compressor to have it abstract between air bounds, for example, to support Presio rel for ZFP, 
Um, you can also use what's called the switch meta compressor to allow you to switch between different compressors. So for example, you can switch between SZ or ZFP and the switch meta compressor can provide you a mechanism for doing that. Um, there's also a meta compressor called Lambda function, um, which allows you to provide an arbitrary Lua script, which will allow you to set the options on the compressor and add your own options to compressors dynamically. So this is a very powerful way um, to try searching some more odd things that otherwise would be very hard to search. Uh, we have a little bit of time left, so I'm going to very briefly go over the GPU support. Um, as a brief aside, um, when you're using GPUs, you need to account for the fact that memory is heterogeneous. Um, so you have host CPU memory, but the GPU also has its own memory, which is separate and distinct um, from the memory on the CPU. Um, some GPU um, will also support the notion of what's called unified shared memory, which allows memory on the host to essentially be used as a cache for the GPU. Um, and within Lidpresio right now, GPU support is pretty much limited to NVIDIA devices um, due to lack of testing um, and improvements needed on the SPAC side. Um, I want to very quickly ask how often people use GPU compressors so I know kind of how much detail to cover here. So it looks like we have several people who use them from time to time as needed. A handful of people develop them or use them all the time. Um, so with that in mind, uh, just a couple of things to be aware of. Um, Lipresio provides compressor plugins for SZ, ZFP, MGuard, and NVComp's GPU compressors. And generally, um, if you provide memory that's allocated on the GPU, um, Lipresio knows that the memory is allocated on the GPU and won't copy the data um, from the CPU to the GPU. It just knows that it's already there, um, allowing you to skip unnecessary copies um, to and from the GPU. So I recommend using this feature when you are using GPU compressors. So that asks the question, how do you use and pass GPU resident memory? Um, Right now, the way that you have to do this is you need to call a platform native allocation call, for example, CUDA malloc, and then wrap it with appropriate Lipresio metadata. So the two routines that you'll use for that are either Presio data new move or Presio data new non-owning. Um, I'm expecting to kind of improve this API within the next year, but right now these are the ways that you have to kind of pass GP resident memory. Uh, I want to kind of briefly go through each of the compressors at this point. So MGuard has OpenMP, CUDA, Sickle, slash one API, and an AMD implementation. It provides its most features in its CPU implementation. Um, currently, the CUDA package is the only one of those four, or the only GPU implementation that we currently support in the SPAC package. Um, but if you compile MGuard yourself, um, it should be functional for these other platforms as well. We just haven't wired everything up in the SPAC package to get it to install everything correctly. Um, SZ has a CUDA implementation called QSZ. Um, there are other implementations, as I understand, in progress um, for other hardware platforms. Uh, it has many similar configuration options to CPU SZ, but there are some minor differences. So I recommend, and I'll show you how to use the um, Lipresio command line to kind of see some of those differences in a minute. Um, ZFP currently only has a publicly available CUDA implementation, and it only supports one mode of their compressors, namely fixed rate mode. Um, as I understand from talking to the developer, there's a non-publicly available AMD and Intel version. Um, we will enable other executors and modes um, when they become available from upstream publicly. 
Um, additionally, um, using NVComp, this is only for NVIDIA hardware. To my understanding, there's not a CPU implementation. Um, this is only for lossless compressors, and there's no longer an open source version of this compressor. Um, we maintain a fork based off the last open source commit, which is what is packaged in SPAC. Um, but you can also provide your own version and configure SPAC to use that to use the closed source version. Um, for now, we are still compatible with the closed source version. Um, it's also possible to use the Presi to provide facilities on top of GPU compressors. So for example, if you have data on the GPU, it's possible with Lipresio to get multi-GPU compressors for free um, out of a single GPU-based compressor. Um, so basically, you can use a meta compressor called chunking, which will divide the data into chunks, pass that to the mini independent threaded compressor module to allow you to compress those chunks in parallel. Um, you can then use the lambda function meta compressor to convert the task ID from the mini independent threaded to a GPU device number. Then you can use the CUDA device selector meta compressor to set the GPU that will be used for a particular thread, and then delegate down to whichever um, GPU compressor that you want. So this is kind of yet another example of cool uses of meta compressors that are possible allowing users to kind of build neat things on top of existing compressors by leveraging reusable components. Um, so at this time, um, we're going to go into kind of our second break um, and kind of open the floor for question and answer. Um, you can attempt exercises three and four in the container. Um, exercise seven does exist in the container, which is for GPU support, but requires CUDA, which was not installed due to licensing restrictions. Um, if you get stuck, um, feel free to look at the README, and I'll be kind of floating around to answer questions. I will now. So now we'll go into developing your own meta compressor um, with the Presio. And Basically, when you go to implement a compressor with Lipresio, you're going to define a C++ class. Um, so here, um, I'm showing two functions, compress and pull and decompress and pull. If you're wanting to kind of follow along with what I'm doing here, um, you can go up to, um, I believe it's exercise five, writing basic compressors. And what we're going to be doing is we're going to be implementing a um, compressor for runlength.h. So what is run length? Run length is just about one of the most commonly used um, compressors that we might talk about. Um, basically, it takes in data of some type T of a certain size, and it's going to basically, every time it sees the zero, it's instead of storing the zero, it's going to store the number of instances of that value into some stream and then return the compressed sequence. And then we have a similar decompress function, um, which will then expand uh, when we have a number of zeros. So this is the function that we're going to do. And then the solution for this is in Presio Runlift solution.cc. Um, so as you can see, defining a, a Libpresio compressor is basically boils down to implementing this Libpresio compressor plugin class right here, and then registering it so that we can actually use it. So if you're kind of wanting to see the big picture, this is the code that I'll be kind of walking through in the slides, um, just so you kind of know where things are coming from. So the, the two kind of bread and butter functions that you need to care about are this compress impl and this decompress impl function which are responsible for, as the names would suggest, compressing and decompressing the data. Um, to do this, you can either call compression routines directly, or in the case of the run length function, um, we want to be able to get at the pointers from these Presio data objects. So there is some helper code here called Presio data for each. Um, which extracts begin and end pointers for the values that we're going to pass in. And we're using, we're passing 
essentially a C++ Lambda function um, here implemented as a struct with an operator parens, um, which basically means that this can be called with the Presio data objects. Um, here we show kind of translating it to a std string and then doing the decode method. Um, since the run link compressor, as it's defined, is infallible, it never fails. Um, we make sure to return zero here. Um, if we wanted to kind of handle errors, um, it would look like something like this. So this is out of a meta compressor that I wrote recently, uh, where we delegated down to some other implementation of the compress function. We retrieve the return value. And then we propagate the error message kind of up the tree. Okay. And remember, if return is greater than zero, we have an error and we have to stop. If return is less than zero, then we have a warning. We still want to set the error, but we don't necessarily have to stop our compression operations because output is guaranteed to have valid data in it when return is either zero or less than zero. After we do that, we need to register the compressor. So here I'm showing an example of registering the CUDA device selector. Um, and the way that this is implemented, um, you say we're registering a compressor. So this is the compressor plugins registry. We just have to give this some arbitrary name. And then we pass a Lambda function. Um, has anybody not seen Lambda functions in C++ before? So just in case anybody is not familiar with this, this is the capture. So basically what variables are we holding on to? Since we're not capturing anything, we're going to have this empty. We're going to have a function of zero arguments, and it's going to return a new unique pointer to an instance of our compressor class. So this is how we tell Libpresio that um, our particular compressors exists. This is what allows you to use these compressors regardless of um, having to explicitly add them to a, a map or something of that sort. So it's making sure that all of the compressor names are registered. Um, if you want to test a compressor um, and you're on Linux, doing so is relatively straightforward. You can use the LD preload environment variable with the path to the shared library um, containing your compiled compressor. And you can pass it to any Libpresio um, application. So what this does is it makes that definition available. And because of the way that we defined our registration plugin, this will get called as soon as the library is loaded. The next thing that you probably will want to do with a compressor is you'll want to specify some options. So that is done in Libpresio with these get options and set options routines. Um, you have, again, the Presio option structure is kind of the main struct that you're going to use to do this. And there are helper functions, get and set, um, that allow you to kind of retrieve and store values to and from these options, keeping in mind a bunch of specific requirements that you need to hold on to for implementing compressors. Um, what happens if you have an opaque type or some other type that's not supported natively by, um, by Libpresio, such as an MPI communicator? Um, Libpresio provides a routine Presio option new user pointer managed. Um, you give it a C function that will handle um, deleting and copying um, this particular function. You can even associate metadata with the pointer. And kind of with this, you have an easy mechanism to kind of pass objects that need to be freed or otherwise reference counted. Um, this allows you to pass things like CUDA stream T's and other more complex data types. Um, if you're doing configuration, um, again, we have the notion of like expressing these pound defines. 
which gives you a way to, as a user, ask what pound defines were set for a particular library in a way that's generic across um, the compressor. So here we can test if as these write stat support was enabled, um, which means that we're going to have different things or whether pastry support was included or time-based compression was included. Um, Libpressio requires a certain amount of metadata. So there's kind of two major pieces of metadata that you need to provide. One is a promise regarding thread safety, and the other is a promise regarding stability. So generally speaking, most compressors are implemented as so-called pure functions in C, which means that they don't depend on global memory. Um, they don't have side effects. Um, so they can safely be used by multiple threads simultaneously. Um, there are a handful of compressors for which this is not true. Um, and in the case that you're using one of these compressors that is not thread safe, um, what you will ultimately want to do is you want to tell Libpressio about that so it doesn't try to use a compressor that is thread safe in a non-thread safe way. Um, Pressio stability gives you some idea of how well supported a particular compressor is within Libpressio. Um, as we pass more and more test cases and we feel more and more confident that they're not going to change the API out from under us, um, we promote compressors from experimental to unstable, ultimately to stable. Um, which means that you can trust that the API is reliable and isn't going to change. Um, Libpressio also provides a function to provide documentation to users. Um, this allows you to power features like in the Libpressio command line. Um, you can say Pressio a help followed by the name of some compressor and you will get extensive user-defined documentation for every option that the compressor supports, along with links to additional information, papers of that, things of that sort. Um, so this can be a very helpful way to kind of learn um, how a particular compressor um, uses this. Um, so just be aware that this exists, and this is kind of what's being supported by the get documentation impl function, is it's how you express this kind of information to um, users. So another question that I kind of vaguely hinted at earlier and was kind of vaguely asked by Pujao earlier was this question of what do we do if we have two identical compressors that we want to configure separately? Um, so the easiest way that you can kind of think about this is if you want to switch between using ZFP's fixed rate mode, which is requires an incompatible set of settings to ZFP's fixed accuracy mode. Um, how might we go about solving this problem? Okay. Now people have thought about it a little bit. Essentially, what we want to be able to do is we want to be able to provide names that correspond to particular subcompressors. So there's a routine in Libpressio called Pressio Compressor Set Name, which gives you the ability to specify this prefix that's going to get used um, for a particular compressor. So this particular example of the switch uh, between, say, two different copies of ZFP is new in this particular version of Libpressio, but you don't have to um, use this version of Libpressio in order to get this feature. So this feature was added back, I think, in like the 0 0.40 range, give or take, um, but it's been implemented for various compressors slowly um, since then. So just kind of keep in mind that you have the ability to kind of configure things differently, but doing this um, often requires users to change their code to adopt for the fact that you're going to use 
um, arbitrary names like this. Um, because now the compressor is no longer named, say ZFP DIMS, now it's named Presio ACC ZFP DIMS or Presio Rate ZFP DIMS. Um, so just being aware that this exists is something that you'll need to account for if and when you need this feature. Um, next, I want to briefly mention this idea of the, quote, laws of metacompressors. So these are basically the requirements that you need to implement if you're going to implement a metacompressor. So metacompressors provide services to other compressors. They can be things like switch or lambda function or um, Presio, Presio op slash opz config that we talked about earlier. Um, we're providing services to compressors. And when we're doing this, uh, we want to make sure that we're implementing these in such a way that they're going to play nicely with the rest of the ecosystem. So generally speaking, you should always check with your child compressors or child modules before configuring yourself. Um, the one exception for this is for prefix colon names. Um, so for example, if you're saying switch names, um, this is how you would set the names for particular subcompressors. Um, you should also provide a reasonable implementation of set name impl to set the names for your children as well. Um, you should, in most cases, delegate to your child compressor modules. You should check error codes and propagate warnings and error messages, as I described earlier. And when you're interfacing with these functions, you should prefer to use the git and set underscore meta versions of the git and set functions to set options for these compressors. Um, if you want to construct a child component, you can ask the registry to build you a particular compressor. Um, the recommended default is no op. And the reason why no op is recommended is because that it's guaranteed to be included with every copy of Libpressio. Um, I accept pull requests for all sorts of interesting and useful features for Libpressio. Um, if you want to submit a pull request, just be aware that you will need to make sure that all of the test cases pass and that you have a SPAC package for your package as well as all of your dependencies and that you're agreeing and contributing the PR to help maintain this functionality for a reasonable period of time. Um, we didn't talk earlier about writing SPAC packages, but writing SPAC packages is relatively straightforward. Here is the SPAC package for the Libpressio Tthresh um, compressor module. Um, you can generally get SPAC to do the right thing by saying SPAC create dollar URL, um, which will generate most of this code for you. Um, the one exception is you'll need to generally provide your own set of dependencies. Um, more information on how to do this correctly is provided in the SPAC documentation. Um, so with this, um, we finished that section much earlier than I was expecting, um, but we'll now kind of transition to our last hands-on activity, which is extending Libpressio. I'll pause the recording and then I'll take any questions that people may have um, on this topic or any other topic that we've covered over the course of the tutorial today. Um, thank you everyone for attending. It's really cool to see so many people show up and interested in what's going on with Libpressio. Thank you.